We immigrated to New Zealand four years ago. We came here on a highly skilled migrant visa. My wife's the highly skilled. I'm just the migrant. <laughs> I'm from Canada. Canada is a term that was gifted to us by our First Nations people. It's an Iroquois word, and it means go back where you came from. <laughs> It's, uh, it's hard being an immigrant in New Zealand. Some words have a completely different meaning, like uh, tramping. <laughs> Where I'm from, tramping is something we go to the next town to do and <laughs> hope word doesn't get back. My friend invited me to go tramping with her. I'm like, Sheila, I'm happily married. <laughs> uh, I love living in New Zealand, but uh, some things are a bit strange. I've discovered you can tell a lot about this place from its cleaning products. New Zealand has two iconic cleaning products, wet and forget and spray and walk away. <laughs> Kiwis want nothing to do with the cleaning. Oh, I just squirt this on and leave? Oh, sweet ass. May as well call it chuck on and take off. Um, one of the, the things I noticed, though, after we moved to New Zealand was I started to gain weight. And we'd been living in Scotland, and I, I did, couldn't understand why. I thought maybe it was the change in climate. Um, you know, maybe it was all that vitamin D. So I did some research, and it turns out I was eating too much. <laughs> <laughs> My beautician recommended a Fitbit. She said it would enable me to track my steps and my heart rate. What a disaster. First day, 88 steps. <laughs> Did you know that thing has a crying emoji? <laughs> Little tiny tear. Like I need a guilt trip from a gadget. If I want to feel terrible, I can go on Instagram like everyone else. <laughs> In our quest for health and wellness, we can fixate on the numbers. Our heart rate, the number of calories we consume, the number of steps we take, our weight. We can obsess over the numbers and overlook simple interventions. In this quest for health and wellness, simple things that don't necessarily cost a lot of money or take a lot of time can have a dramatic impact. I propose that the best way to have a happier tomorrow is to throw yourself in the path of comedy today. I'm going to share some surprising research and I'm going to propose a simple intervention, something I call a comedy intervention, that can have a dramatic impact. I love comedy. I'm passionate about it. Even before I went to school, I loved watching Carol Burnett and Lily Tomlin. And I'll never forget the first night, that night, my comedy universe exploded. My parents were hosting a Christmas party. So I was up after my bedtime. Music and the dancing got too much, so I went in another room, turned on the TV, and saw Dan Aykroyd for the first time. He was parodying the television chef, Julia Child. Dressed in a dress and an apron, he was trying to remain composed after slicing open his finger, preparing a chicken. The blood was spurting everywhere. Ultimately, he expired behind the kitchen island. It was the funniest thing I had ever seen. Stumbling onto Saturday Night Live that night, a new world opened up to me. It was the first time I'd seen my sense of humor on television. I'm passionate about comedy. I studied it for my honors thesis, and 25 years later, I made my stand-up debut. Today, I'm a speaker, a stand-up comedian, and an entrepreneur. I'm in sales. Whether I'm 
selling an idea, selling jokes, or selling super premium gin. <laughs> Making my audience laugh improves my results. I do stand-up several times a week, and I see the effect a night of stand-up comedy has on people. They're happier after the show than when they arrived. And while I haven't tested their blood, it's clear they're in a better mood when they leave than when they arrived. What is it about a night of stand-up comedy that has such a positive impact on people? And why might you benefit from a comedy intervention? It's been three years since the pandemic struck. We're still reeling from its impact. A lot of us are working from home. And while that's convenient, have meetings online, communicate electronically, we are missing out. We're physically isolated, but we're also socially isolated. We're missing out on the informal social interaction of a workplace. The water cooler chat, if you will, that would punctuate our day with laughter. We're increasingly isolated, but we're also increasingly anxious. We're in the midst of a cost of living crisis, and we're worried that our tomorrow doesn't look that rosy. In this context, feeling anxious may feel like a rational response, but it's not going to make your tomorrow better or brighter. My mother had an expression, in extremis, laugh. I didn't know what the Latin in extremis meant, but I could deduce it. When things look their worst, the best thing you can do is laugh. My mother had a fantastic sense of humor, and so did my father. Even when he was the target of one of my mother's witty reposts, he would chuckle and say, ah, well, if we can't have a laugh every now and again. He would trail off, but the message was clear. Having a laugh makes life worth living. My father had spent World War II in the belly of a Lancaster bomber, thousands of miles and an ocean away from his young family. He knew the devastating, deadly impact of the bombs he was ordered to drop as a bombardier. And he was grateful to make it home safely to his wife and baby boy. And he savored the good times. I'm the youngest in my family. I'm in a big family. And when I was in my third year of university, my mother died. Six months later, my father died. I had quickly gone from having two loving parents to none. To paraphrase the Irish playwright Oscar Wilde, to lose one parent may be considered a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> Things felt very bleak. And when I probably could have used it the most, I didn't remember my mother's words of wisdom. The following year, it was time for me to choose my thesis topic. And it's only in retrospect I realized I chose something that did me a great deal of good. I chose Canadian television comedy. Two sketch comedy programs, Codco and The Kids in the Hall. And I must say that during those months after my parents had first died, the grief was devastating. Uh, coming home from visiting my, my uh, siblings, I would occasionally consider driving into oncoming traffic, crossing the median. But I couldn't risk injuring an innocent person. And ultimately, I didn't want to kill myself. I just wanted the pain to, to stop. And in the course of researching my thesis, I watched hundreds of hours of television comedy. I chose two Canadian sketch comedy programs, Codco and The Kids in the Hall. 
And watching these programs and researching my thesis, I laughed. And I laughed. And the more I laughed, the better I felt. Sitting in that tiny little screening room in front of that tiny monitor, bit by bit, joke by joke, punchline by ch punchline, it eased my grief. I started to feel better. So it's only in retrospect, it was a happy coincidence that I chose that topic. We've all heard the expression, laughter is the best medicine, but I'd never given it much thought. In the past five decades, there have been reams of research. It all started with Norman Cousins an American journalist who chronicled his recovery from a devastating disease. He documented in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1976, he documented how just 10 minutes of laughter eased the pain of ankylosing spondylitis, a form of arthritis that affects the spine. In his 1979 best-selling book, Anatomy of an Illness, as perceived by the patient, he documented his partnership with his doctor, how they combined traditional medicine with laughter and positive thinking. It was groundbreaking. Since then, reams of peer-reviewed research in the past decades have documented the power of laughter, the healing potential it holds. Research of uh, women, healthy women, uh, showed that after watching a comedy film, the, the bloodstream levels of natural killer cells were elevated. These are the cells that defend against infections and cancer. A Japanese study documented how people with a form of dermatitis had less severe reactions to an allergic stimulus after watching a Charlie Chaplin film. Other research has showed that activities which cultivate positive emotions, activities like watching a humorous video, actually build resilience and enhance cognitive power. Now, most of these studies have used comedy films to elicit traditional laughter. Regular laughter is an involuntary response, a bit like a sneeze but not as messy. But it turns out that even laughter that's manufactured can have a positive impact. Like the laughter in laughter yoga, it uses voluntary or intentional laughter and it combines it with yoga breathing techniques. A brand new study has shown that type two diabetics have improved glycemic control after a 12-week program of laughter yoga. Laughter yoga! The study's authors state that having fun may be a self-care intervention. Having fun could be a self-care intervention. It makes sense. It makes sense that comedy and the mirthful laughter that it generates would make us feel better. And yet, we don't make a point of scheduling it. We schedule other things that are good for us. Holidays, sleep, exercise. It's time we made time for laughter. It's clear. The research shows laughter has a tremendously beneficial effect on us. It lowers blood pressure, strengthens our immune system, it builds our resilience. Both Norman Cousins and I experienced the relief that laughter can provide. He's, he got relief from a devastating illness, I got relief from devastating grief. And so I say to you, in all seriousness, if things look bleak, if tomorrow looks like it's going to be even worse than today, throw yourself in the path of comedy. 
Go see stand-up or improv. Watch a funny movie or TV show. Watch a cat video if that's your thing. <laughs> anything that makes you laugh is a good thing. Because anything that makes you laugh will give you a better tomorrow. Remember my mother's words of wisdom. In extremis, laugh. Laugh in the face of doom. And watch its power over you diminish. Perhaps one day our wearable tech won't just track our heart rate or number of steps. Perhaps one day these gadgets will tally our TDL, total daily laughs, <laughs> and calculate our ALPD, average laughs per day. If the number's too low, we'll know we're overdue for some laughs. Perhaps that gadget on your wrist will even schedule a comedy intervention on your behalf. It'll be a lot better than my Fitbit giving me the crying emoji. Yeah.